Good evening everyone. My name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this evening. We are very grateful to Peninsula Hot Springs for sponsoring this webinar and allowing for it to be offered free of charge. Peninsula Hot Springs is an award-winning natural hot springs and day spa destination on the Mornington Peninsula just 90 minutes from Melbourne. We will also be having a stretch break during the webinar compliments of Peninsula Hot Springs. Tonight's webinar is the last under the banner of Move Muscle Bone and Joint Health. As of this week, we are rebranding as Musculoskeletal Australia. Our new logo should be on your screens now. Changing our name and brand was a decision we made while working closely with our key stakeholders, members and volunteers. We chose Musculoskeletal Australia as it encompasses all conditions and supports individuals on their journeys. Musculoskeletal Australia will adopt a person-centred, self-directed approach to empower consumers through education and support services. Musculoskeletal Australia has some great webinars for the remainder of the year, as you can see by the list on your screens now. You can purchase the webinars individually or as a series, and the recordings of previous webinars are available for purchase at any time. Our presenter for this evening will be Dr Adam Castricum. Adam became a fellow with the Australasian College of Sports Physicians in 2008. He was appointed Chief Medical Officer for Athletics Australia soon after and headed up the medical team for the successful Australian track and field team at the 2012 London Olympics. In 2015, he joined the Australian College of Sports Physicians Board as Vice President and became President of the newly named Australasian College of Sport and Exercise Physicians in 2016. Adam is passionate about sport and exercise and takes great satisfaction out of helping all members of the community achieve their goals in a safe and healthy fashion, whether they are elite athletes or simply inactive patients wishing to gain a gain active and healthier life um, uh, and, and overall a more rewarding life. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Adam. Thanks very much, Adam. Thank you, Jen, and thank you everyone for uh, taking out a bit of time on a Tuesday night to have a listen to, to me speak about the uh, multidisciplinary approach to managing knee osteoarthritis and setting a chronic disease. And thank you to, to MOVE, and, and most of all, thank you to uh, Pinchel Hot Springs for allowing everyone to tune into this uh, for nothing. And I, I guess uh, um, congratulations to Jen on the new name, Musculoskeletal Australia. I think that's a, a real positive move. Um, so we'll, we'll get on with the, uh, the talk. So. I guess the first thing is I don't have any personal disclosures other than really wanting to improve patient outcomes in, in terms of pain, function and quality of life. Um, as I said, I work at Olympic Park Sports Medicine here in Melbourne and I see 95% um, of my time are with patients from the community. So very much in touch with the challenges that we have, particularly as we're getting more and more patients with this presentation. Um, the first thing is the just the other week there was the Insight Program uh, on joint replacement. And there was a gentleman in the bottom right hand corner, Reese, you may, if you've watched it, recall, who had 11 knee operations from, I guess, being a teenager. And it's, uh, without really knowing what the details of the case are, it was struck me when I watched it at the end that he actually came to see, uh, came to see a physiotherapist who, who really educated him about what he had. And there's a couple of quotes at the top, which are what I thought were quite, uh, quite telling. And the first is by gaining a better understanding of what I was experiencing and having an understanding of what it meant, it allowed me to get past a lot of issues because I was informed. I think we need to go through progression of steps before it gets to the point of surgery, he says. So I guess it was a really timely sort of uh, episode because it's sort of how can we do this better? We've got a problem here. We're, we're, not, we're not probably doing as best we can. The first one is osteoarthritis, as we know. It's a degenerative condition affecting the hands, spine, joints. Uh, and the, such as the hips, the knees and ankles, it usually gets wor worse over time. It's worse in females, two out of three. Uh, one in 11 Australians have this. Uh, that's about 2.1 million as of 2014 and 15. And interesting, one in, one in four people with osteoarthritis uh, reported fair or poor health. That's twice as much as people without the condition. The the next slide sort of tells us about the prevalence, as I said, females are more likely to get it as they get older. The next is, as I said, they're more like, uh, people with OA are more likely to get chronic conditions such as cardiovascular disease, low back pain, mental health issues, asthma, CPD, and also diabetes and cancer. So there's got to be a better way that we can look after this, particularly in our indigenous population where the 
the prevalence of OA is higher and often they don't have access to the appropriate care and it makes it hard for us to close the gap in their health out outcomes. Um, as far as chronic disease, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, cr chronic disease now affects 50% of Australians and at least one of those has a major chronic disease, which are those listed below. And one of those includes obesity. At the moment, 28% of Australians have obesity, or 2015 they did, 28% of Australians have obesity. And as much as two thirds of the Australian population are considered overweight or obese. But the worrying one is their kids. Up to a quarter of kids are overweight or obese when it's now sitting at about eight or nine percent. So we're sort of setting them up to fail if we don't manage this. Some data from the from this insight program the other week has it 2014-15. Uh, the traditional management, I guess, of knee osteoarthritis is a knee arthroscopy, and uh, mainly for meniscal tears or chondral issues, which are indeed part of the osteoarthritic process. And they peaked at 80,000, as I said, in 2014-15. The this is despite some evidence coming through since 2002, and this is one from 2017, saying that randomised control trials have questioned the role of a knee scope for knee OA. And the evidence has now continued to accumulate to the point that a paper was put out by the BJSM last year where a panel of experts recommended against the use of arthroscopy in nearly all patients with degenerative knee disease based on linked systematic reviews. And that further research was unlikely to alter this recommendation. And health funders may use the number of arthroscopies performed in patients with degenerative knee disease as an indicator of quality of care. So, we're continuing to do them, and I, I, there are instances where it is ab absolutely indicated. I'm not saying that we should take them away completely, but there's still probably too many to be done. Um, as far as knee replacements, there's increasing rates, to the, which may be, well be a reflection of an ageing population, but I'm not sure it accounts for a 285% increase in the number of knee replacements from 1994 to 2014 in Victoria, which is a significant cost so not only the federal government through Medicare, but also insurers and patients. So I think we've got to get the manage of this a lot better. You can look at the, the other concerning thing is that the number of primary knee replacements is actually now becoming more prevalent in younger people. So it's coming down to the 55 and, and 65 age bracket. And what the complication of that is, is that the rate of revision in these younger cohorts is higher too. Um, which is again not entirely surprising given we are living longer now than we ever have. So it's how can we reduce the revision rate or even the actual primary rate? Reassuringly, it's interesting to see on this, this graph here, if you look at the red line, the 49561 looks at the number of arthroscopies over the last 10 years, and this is Medicare data, and it shows that the number of knee scopes has actually dropped by 25%. Now this is only one number for a knee scope, there's another six numbers that are there. So the trend that is now starting to take effect now, whether it's related to the fact that the number of MRIs, which is in green, has gone up, that's gone up from 100,000 up to 250,000 over five years, and that's due to GPs having prescribing rights for, for MRIs for knees. So it's a massive blowout in the budget of, for, for knee MRIs, but at the same time it's brought down the number of uh, knee arthroscopies. But the number of knee replacements continues to rise. So, what's the solution? In 2017, the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare launched an OA knee clinical care standard after consultation with a number of organisations who are listed here, not all of which were signatories to the, um, to the standard. And it had key messages around assessment, diagnosis, which was diagnosis making it more clinical, with if any imaging was required, weight bearing x-rays, and an MRI only if the suspicion of serious pathology. And there was a bigger emphasis on, or the biggest emphasis on education, self-management, weight loss and exercise. It also described the medicines which were, could be useful, including paracetamol, anti-inflammatories and opiates for severe pain, which since then have been, this is maybe, uh, should be different. And others were included as well as injectables, which were cortisone injection, not, so that's the plural, not a, not a singular, and hyaluronic acid. But again, the evidence continues to emerge as to whether these are appropriate or well, the numbers are appropriate. And for surgery, they said arthroscopy only for a locked knee. And if it wasn't responding to conservative treatment, then you could progress to other joint conserving or indeed joint replacement surgery. 
So then in 2018, earlier this year, MOVE with the, the Victorian Government launched a model of care for hip and knee osteoarthritis. And this was a much more, I guess, uh, look more at the disease and the whole person. I think it, it, it had an emphasis on the continuum of disease and the management of each phase, going from early, ongoing, and then to advanced disease, disease management. And it also so caught up this Venn diagram here, which is breaking up the components of care into non-surgical, non-pharmacological, pharmacological care, and then surgical care. Making sure that everyone gets the, the first one, the, the, the bigger blue one first. And it also promoted a holistic model of management, looking at the whole person, looking at their social supports, their occupation, their mood, uh, other musculoskeletal pain, and other chronic diseases. And I think this is a really good model to be using. So it sort of refined the diagnosis. It was similar to the, 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 the national guidelines. It can be diagnosed clinically without a need for imaging. And I still think that's totally uh, uh, appropriate. Weight-bearing x-rays are the first-line imaging choice. And there's no need for MRI unless it's an atypical presentation. And it's interesting that a few weeks ago, the NDS review actually decided to stop GPs ordering MRI needs in over 50-year-olds. Um, and that would be effective from November 1, 2018, because it was felt that it doesn't really alter management. And that's going to save the, the government probably a good, uh, good $30, $40 million. Um, so uh, that's a welcome decision. I, I think it's, it's going to be a little bit, uh, it'll uh, be difficult for patients who actually require it to access it, but I think it's important that we then improve the access for them to be able to get rebatable stands through the specialist. The next is, here's an x-ray here, weight-bearing x-ray that you can see. Um, this is someone who's had an ACL graft before, and also they've probably got some lateral joint space bearing indicative of lateral uh, osteoarthritis. Now, the most important thing to get with your x-rays is make sure you get a styline view so you can look at the patellofemoral joint, as they will often have patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Now, as far as MRI scans, now the reports of MRI scans can be scary. They're scary to patients. Patients often don't know what all the words mean. This is a posterior horn medial meniscal tear, which you could argue doesn't look particularly unstable and a little bit of wear through the medial cartilage. Now, if this is a 50-year-old, 60-year-old, this is probably very normal for them um, and uh, suggests that this is actually a normal part of aging. But when you get the report, which then starts to show, what is the MRI here, sorry, medium municipal care at the back, but when you start to actually see the report like this, this actually can scare patients. They're not sure what it means. They'll see meniscal tear, they'll see full thickness articular cartilage defect, and they start to sort of panic about, oh, here's my knees falling apart, what do I do? And it's often up to us as practitioners to actually undo that report. Um, and that's the, that takes up a lot of time to do that. Um, so it's most important in your assessment is that you treat the patient and not the scan. It must be a holistic approach through that biopsychosocial social model, looking at social factors, their social supports, beliefs, concerns of the knowledge about pain and osteoarthritis, occupational impact, mood, sleep, and pain features, and also consider their attitudes to exercise and any other comorbidities. And it's also important that we start to utilise patient reported outcome measures, which I think with time will become more of a, uh, through technology, through our phones, we're going to be able to be more, much, much more connected with how we can monitor these. And I think that's the great challenge for us as clinicians about how we, how we can actually uh, use that data to then prove that what we're doing is actually improving patient outcomes. Uh, as far as the delivery of care, I'm also pleased to see that the, the recommendations would, should be delivered by a multidisciplinary team of health providers with the GP as the central care coordinator. Uh, it should be provided within a whole person social uh, psycho-biomedical model that includes comorbidity management. Because as you see, there's a, as you can see earlier, there's a lot of overlap between osteoarthritis and chronic disease. And it's the attention to this, and in, and in particular their mental health conditions, that will probably improve outcomes. And it's important that we support care delivery in local settings rather than the tertiary hospital settings. And I think this needs to be a real focus of where we move to, that we're doing these more community-based musculoskeletal clinical centres for people with advanced osteoarthritis or complex presentations or community-based multidisciplinary osteoarthritis programs and indeed outreach services to multidisciplinary outreach services to rural areas, including Indigenous communities. 
um, where often uh, they need our services the most. So when I start seeing a patient, I guess the first thing, you, once you've found out they've got osteoarthritis of the knee, it's important to assess for other comorbidities, whether it's cardiovascular, cancer, diabetes, osteoarthritis, I mean, respiratory issues, mental illness, and previous joint surgery, particularly away from the knee, and in particularly the hip, I guess. Um, the, it's also good to look at their medications, and medications that I look at for are beta blockers. And beta blockers, can, uh, they block a heart rate increase with exercise, which sort of makes it hard when you're telling someone to, to exercise to monitor their heart rate, because it's not going to be accurate. We talk about metformin, which is one of the first line drugs for type 2 diabetes. Um, this may actually blunt the effect of exercise um, on certain cardiovascular risk factors and also the severity of metabolic syndrome in patients with early diabetes. So you would consider ceasing metformin when you're giving someone exercise so that the effect of exercise is greater. As far as statin, uh, statins similarly do that. You get statins for uh, high cholesterol. They again can blunt the effect of exercise particularly in obese and overweight patients. So again, it comes down to a decision, do I stop the statin so I can give them exercise, particularly if the statin can sometimes be causing muscle soreness, which is a common side effect. And as far as insulin, it's also important, important to watch the dose and the effect, because if, if the more exercise that you do, uh, the less uh, insulin that you will need. Um, and again, prednisolone is something else to watch, particularly as it may uh, reveal a history of osteoporosis, um, and that may include stress factors and muscle injuries. And I guess the other one is also to ask how many cortisone injections have they had in their joint. Um, the next one is examination. Look, it's important to get the vital signs, but the, the new one is the exercise vital sign, which is a big push from exercise as medicine in the, U the US. And I guess I want to know, you're asking your patient, how many minutes of moderate, acti moderate intensity activity do you do in a week? And uh, it's best to look at how long are your sessions of moderate intensity activity and then how many days a week do you do that and that will give you your number of minutes out of 150. But I, I guess I'd classify it more as are you very active, are you sufficiently active, are you relatively inactive and are you just inactive? And I guess the ones that are just inactive functionally are not going to be good when you assess their, assess their lower limbs particularly. And it's also a good idea to get an idea of their cardio respiratory examination. Um, I, I was at a conference the other week of the My Electronic Health Record, and I, this is on my phone. This is my exercise data from last year, 39 minutes a day, and I would love to see this uploaded into everyone's medical records. Um, so I, I keep pushing this, and I hope that we will be able to see this, and it's, I certainly advise if your patients do have their phones with them and look up their health record, you can actually get a really good exercise history of their last 12 months, and indeed months or three months off that. So I, I, I use this. Again, as I said, investigations, Again, not only weight-bearing x-rays, it's whether we need to do bloods, particularly if there's a history of cancer, uh, thinking about bone scans and PET scans, particularly if we're worried about bone pain and whether it's actually a metastasis. And for the diabetics, you might just making sure their feet are okay, their eyes, and also if there's any evidence of sort of neuropathy, and also checking the urine. And as far as asthma, looking at respiratory function tests if required. So the move components of care, they're listed here. And the blue is what everyone should get. The, the light blue is what you know some people might get. And I guess the the, the aqua is I guess uh, if they're failing those two, they might go into th that area. So I'm going to take you through each of those. Lifestyle, I guess, um, pharmacolo uh, So it, lifestyle should be given by everyone. Allied health, all medical practitioners, um, pharmacological. I'm not, when I say pharmacological, I think there's over the counter medications which. I guess with caution could be advised by the allied health professionals, but I think we've got to be careful um, because there may be some side effects and also there may be some evidence that some of them actually don't really do much. So I think it's one of those ones that certainly don't, don't ask people to take them for a very long time and to follow up with, their, with their, their medical practitioner if they're certainly not getting better. So I guess that's where pharmacological comes in and then I guess the surgery is left to the surgeons. And also, you know, we might be getting to the point now where bariatric surgery for obesity may be a part of the treatment. Um, so starting with lifestyle, education is key, and this takes time. It takes us all time to explain a condition. It takes us time to work out what our patients want to do, and it takes us it takes time to explain management options. And, and and it's all about empowering the patient and giving them a positive message that they can get better. So smoking, there's very mixed evidence for this. Um, there is also uh, massage. Uh, 
very serious mixed evidence that smokers have a greater cartilage loss and more pain. Uh, I think that's, that's very important uh, that we advise everyone to get off, off smoking. Um, weight loss. Now, this is the other ele elephant in the room. Um, there's a 10% reduction in weight associated, uh, I guess, if you, you get that, you reduce your pain scores by 50%. There's good evidence for this, and that's the first thing I tell my patients, particularly those who are overweight. The best anti-inflammatory will give you about 25% pain relief. But weight loss will improve not only your physical function, but will also reduce your um, chronic disease risk. And I guess as far as dietary advice, less than 25% of our patients receive good advice. And one of them is you can't outrun a bad diet. People think they can do more exercise, but you know, they, they, their, their, their appetite can, can go up with that. So it's important that we get some good advice going. And these are all the sort of, I guess, the advice that's out there at the moment. There's fast diet, there's high carb, oh, sorry, low carb, high fat diet. There's the Australian Guide for Healthy Eating. The Royal Australian College of Physicians, uh, Physicians put out their position statement on the management of obesity last week. And this is a good read. Um, it's, a, it's a solid read. Um, and I think that we need to really be getting, getting evidence-based management of, of obesity. Uh, and they're, they're on the right track with it. Um, and it's just, I think we need to collate all this evidence to actually educate not only our allied health professionals, but also our doctors are how to manage um, obesity with nutritional advice. And I think that part of what I do when I'm consulting is I try to really educate patients that, yeah, you've got a loading problem and we need to reduce your load. And through that, it's going to be uh, weight loss and that's got to be through healthy eating. And one of the, one of the things that's listed in the RACP um, physician statement is it says for adults who are overweight or obese, prescribe approximately 300 minutes of moderately intensity intensity activity or 150 minutes of vigorous activity or an equivalent combination of moderate intensity and vigorous activities each weight combined with reduced dietary intake. Now if you're giving an obese patient 300 minutes of, re, uh, sorry, 150 minutes of vigorous activity, there's, there's some risk associated with that. There's risk associated with not only their weight and there's also a risk associated with, if they've got diabetes, 50% of diabetics don't even have chest pain when they exercise. So it's actually hard. But it's really hard to, we need to be very careful with some of the advice and make sure that it's given and given in a graded, graded uh, fashion. Because we know that physical inactivity, according to the, the paper from um, Blair back in 2009, is, is more likely to even smoke a diabetes, low, low fitness. And those who do not find time for exercise will have to find uh, time for illness. So that's, a, that's one of the, uh, the things that I tell a lot of people. You really need, need to find time for exercise. And there's a lot of benefits to exercise. Um, you can reduce your all-cause mortality by 30%, cardiovascular disease by up to 35%, type 2 diabetes by 40%, colon and breast cancers by between 20 and 30%, and depression and other mental illnesses by... 30% and indeed hip fractures and dementia. So there's a lot of benefits to exercise and as I say that exercise, if you could uh, prescribe it as a pill, would be the, the best medication that we have. Now you should all know the National Physical Activity Guidelines and the first is that you know any physical activity is better than none and start by doing some and gradually building it up and be active on most, sorry preferably all days of, of the week and accumulate between 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity a week or in combination. And it's also important to do muscle strengthening activities on at least two days each week and also limit your sedentary behaviour, minimising the amount of time you spend in prolonged sitting and break it up as much as possible. And in those over 65 years old, at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity a day and additional flexibility and balance exercises. So with that, I'll ask everyone to stand up and have a break and watch the, our exercise break.
Jeff Prem and today I'm going to take you through my stretch and release program that I've designed for the Peninsula Hot Springs. We're going to be working the entire body focusing on both static and dynamic stretches which are beneficial for both body and for mind. We're going to be working on the performance of your entire body whilst improving flexibility and range of motion whilst also aiding in relaxation and stress. All you will need for this workout is a yoga mat and a positive attitude. Let's get started. Throughout this entire sequence, we want to keep a huge focus on the breath. The breath is so important when you're stretching. You want to inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, reoxygenating the blood. Taking your hands lightly onto your rib cage, inhale that nice lateral breath out to the side, exhale as you pull the rib cage back down to your centre. Inhale out and exhale down as you come back to your centre. That's the breath pattern we want to work on throughout all the moves. We're going to start standing nice and tall, feeling your feet grounded into the mat. Imagine you have two lines running straight up through the middle of your body, past your kneecaps, past your hips, up past your chest and out through your shoulders, standing tall with your shoulders pulled slightly back behind you. I want you to drop your chin to chest and we're going to roll down into a nice spine curl, vertebrae by vertebrae as you roll all the way down and letting your head relax at the bottom of the movement. Pulling your belly button back to centre as you scoop all the way back up to standing and just let your shoulder blades go behind you. And again, chin to chest, rolling down, vertebrae by vertebrae, really feeling it unpeel. Then I want you to nod your head yes and no, no and yes. Yes and no, no and yes. Scooping your chin to chest, belly button into your centre and curling all the way back up and roll your shoulder blades back. Then we're going to get the body moving, nice dynamic movements. Inhale as you sit back through your heels, exhale as you pull forward. Just small little squats on the spot, exhale as you pull forward, focusing on that stomach and that belly button pulling into your centre. Exhale as you come through. Once you feel yourself starting to warm up, we're going to add a calf raise. Come up onto your toes, down through your heels, back into the squat, all the way up. Getting everything moving, waking up the back chain of your body. Inhale down, exhale up. 10 to 15 of these. Adam, feel free to continue. Thank you. Shall I go to the next slide? So I guess, thank you everyone for getting up. I hope that's a better after a bit of a stretch and a bit of a, a stand up just to, to get the, the blood flowing. Um, so I guess the, 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 the advice is if you can do any exercise, do anything, and whether you do it as an individual, do it as a group, get a dog, um, you know, try and make it as social as you can and have to try and get an ex a sheet of exercises just to, to show you how you can do this. So taking advice, but the thing is we've got to, re we've got to really, we've got to really, I guess, address the issues and the barriers to why people don't want to exercise. A lot of it is pain, a lot of it's body image, mental health, anxiety, depression, it's illness, and I guess, I guess if you've got cancer, it's important that you discuss it with the oncologist. But I guess a lot of it comes down to affordability, it comes down to equipment, do people need access or have access to equipment, do they have concessions or private health, and the other thing is the chronic health care plan, I guess, is it's only limited to five sessions in allied health a year with physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, podiatrists, dietitians, massage therapists, and I guess the thing is that if we could get the federal government to fund more of those, I think that that would be a really a really good initiative to help people actually get out and do some more, some more, uh, some more uh, structured exercise. And I guess the other is the mental health plan. We can't forget that as well. As far as people with chronic pain have also uh, 
psychological issues that I think also need addressing. And again, it comes down to time, particularly for busy people, and motivation for people, particularly if they feel like they've exhausted everything that they actually need to do. So the first thing I think is it's really important that we tell people that it's safe to move. It's a, it's a really important message. And just because you've got pathology, just because you've got an MRI that says that you've got something on X-ray that says something, this is normal. We've got to normalise that and say, look, it's okay for you to do exercise. And as far as aerobic exercise, we like to limit impact where we can. And in saying that, you might be able to get back to some running down the track a little bit. But we start off with, with lower impact activities like walking, cycling, water-based activities or the cross trainer. As I said, make it social three to five times a week. 15 sets of 10-minute sessions are just as effective as five sets of 30-minute sessions at moderate intensity. And I guess if you've got severe osteoarthritis, try and exercise every couple of days, every three days to allow recovery. And the intensity should be holding a conversation, but you know, not singing certainly not a long song. Um, and also remember to reinforce the importance of incidental exercise, whether it's stairs or walking to public transport. And avoiding injury is important. It's important that you have the appropriate, comfortable footwear. You might replace it every six months or 500 kilometres of walking. You've got to be comfortable. Again, avoiding that consecutive day high impact loading, which is also good, I guess, as a preventative thing. Um, and monitoring fatigue and pain, waiting until it sort of settles, not completely, but to, to a comfortable level before you resume. And sticking to the progression of maybe increasing your volume by, I guess, 10% a week. The strength program is a must. And I guess the other thing is if you are, are tight and you are sore, also it's important to have to, to get a massage and to, to, to loosen up those tight muscles because often they're not strong enough to deal with what you need to be doing just yet. And as you get stronger, they will start to uh, loosen up a bit. Because at the end of the day, as I always say to my patients, the reason you're in here is you aren't strong enough to carry your load. And I think that we really need to enforce that that's the way that we get that. So strength program, there's the resistance exercises, just focusing on quads, lumbar pelvic areas, gluteal, calves and strength. Uh, strength, neuromuscular training and balance, twice a week initially supervised and progressed, looking at low weights initially with high repetitions, making them functional with some balance, stretching, and also some massage through, as I said, through those areas. And a really good example of that that's being rolled out around the world at the moment is the GLAD program, which is in Australia. I know it's going, uh, it's come from um, Scandinavia. And these are some of the recommendations that, that come through that. But it's a lot about education. It's a lot about strengthening. So it's important that we, we really reinforce the strength program. And, it, and the other thing is it's important to, you know, people sometimes don't really want to move because they're worried they're going to make themselves sore. And Laura mimosi has got a, a number of great uh, resources on the Pain Revolution website about how do I know if I'm safe to move. So I'd advise you all to go and check that out. Um, there's also Pain the Beast, which is a really, really um, good video for people to watch about persistent pain and how reframing the pain. Um, so I recommend that for people to watch. And also, I guess, to then... Not, um, so I recommend that for people to watch. And also, I guess, to then not really helping to see psychologists or even to uh, look at seeing anaesthetists or pain management specialists um, who are trained, these are resources here, on crossing across anaesthesia, psychiatry, rehab, physiotherapy, psychology, nursing. So as I said, managing pain is multifaceted just as managing osteoarthritis is, is multidisciplinary. I'm talking about braces, there are braces or orthotics that could also be used to try and realign the lower limb. Now these can be expensive, particularly the braces. There's the medial deloading braces, they can work in some instances, but these are probably better for, for manual workers or those who really want to maintain activity. And I guess orthotics also, if someone's got a bit of medial knee osteoarthritis, a lateral wedge in their heel might help them, or if they've got lateral knee osteoarthritis, um, certainly the appropriate footwear, but an orthotic will also help for that too. And then we move, I guess, into the pharmacological area. Now, of the supplements, I mean, there's a number out there, but they, they have a limited role. Um, and most of them have a very high placebo component as high as 60%. So glucosamine, I guess, has been the best study. Again, it's whether they're industry funded or they're independent. Um, it's got limited side effects, but it's certainly not no side effects. Um, and my recommendation to people, provided they don't have uh, any issues is 1,500 milligrams of glucosamine sulfate for three months, and then they come off it. If they come off it and the pain returns, then they're probably a responder and they probably can continue to, to take that, that, that supplement. And then the next one, I think we get into Panadol, Osteo, Paracetamol. Um, we're also getting into the, the range of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and these are widely prescribed. 
uh, but they should be considered second line treatment. Exercise is probably the best pain reliever that we have. You're getting out there and doing something and actually endorphins are very good at, at um, reducing your pain. Paracetamol is evidence that no longer is that actually effective for knee osteoarthritis. Um, Anti-inflammatories, which are good for flares, I generally stick to these for a week, no more than no more than a couple of weeks. But I also have to make sure that people don't have any issues, particularly with their heart, blood pressure, asthma, or their gut, because if their gut has got some uh, reflux, it's not good to stir that up. And also, then we might get into chronic pain medications and opiates. I'm not sure that's the way to go. I mean, the governor has just taken opiates off the off the off the, uh, off the uh, shelf in, in pharmacies, which I think is a good move, because all that does is create addiction. And then we don't. We actually people don't really cope so well. And then there's also bone modulating me, uh, medications, which yeah, not not sure just yet where they might live because they do have significant side effects, and I certainly would stay away from those. Um, the next, I guess, is, as I said, paracetamol is useless in treating osteoarthritis pain, uh, pain. and that comes from 90, a 74 randomised controlled trial comparing it to placebo. Um, it's only got up to four percent chance of being effective, whereas anti-inflammatory more than 95% are likely to help. Both cortisone injections, and I've deliberately put an asterisk, and I've deliberately put the S in in brackets because it's whether is one state is multiple. Um, the mechanism of this is it's a potent anti-inflammatory. It's the first line injection treatment in the Orsi guidelines from 2013. We're still waiting on the updated version of those, uh, the comprehensive updated version. The Cochrane Review in 2015 said they're poor in the short term, and and we're talking there two to two to two to four weeks, but absent in the medium to long term. And the Journal of America, uh, the, the, the Journal of American Medical Association 2017 study showed that if you have a repeat cortisone injection monthly, which is unusual, for six months it's associated with a loss of cartilage and no reduction in pain at a two-year follow-up. So. I'm a bit reluctant to go for a repeat cortisone injection in my patients, and it would only if it's really going to be, um, it's really, uh, really a flared up knee. Hyaluronic acid, this is listed, these ones with the ticks are listed in the Australian Commission Safety and Quality in Healthcare. That's why they're ticks, because they're approved by the, the national body. There's some conjecture about where this sits. The mechanism for this is it replaces joint synovial fluid, which is locked in osteoarthritis, and, and I guess is a lubricant for shear stress and a shock absorber for compressive stress. It's like putting Castrol GTL, G, G, uh, GDX oil in your knee. And the evidence for this is inconclusive. It consistently improves outcomes for hyaluronic acid injections versus placebo in the medium term. The Orsi guidelines in 2013 said it was uncertain for knee osteoarthritis. But a recent meta-analysis in 2016 said that it may be beneficial for knee OA, and one further in 2016 said it's better than cortisone in the medium term. And a recent French study even said that it delays time to requiring a total knee replacement. Hey, Rich Padma, question mark. The evidence is sort of getting there, but it's still, unfortunately, I said, don't think that it grows cartilage because it's more of an anti-inflammatory. And the, the reason for the, the lack of, I guess, it doesn't work or it doesn't is because there's a variable composition in that they're either, I remember doing a few of these early on and I remember taking blood from people and not you know, sending them off for pathology to see exactly how much platelet was it in it. And some of them were platelet poor, some of them were platelet rich. It wasn't, it's, it's very variable how you do it if you're doing it through a centrifuge. So I guess it makes it difficult to interpret the evidence. And a systematic review in 2016 Looked at six articles, five with a high risk of bias and poor methodology, and the number of knees was 817, with a mean of only 38 weeks follow-up. So I'm not sure that we have the, the right evidence just as yet. And um, I, I think we, the jury's still out on this. There's a very good trial, double, it's a um, multi-centre, double-blind, double blind randomised controlled trial going on at the moment at both uh, in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, it's been led, uh, it's coming through the ANZ Musculoskeletal Trials Network, and this is looking at uh, people with knee osteoarthritis. It's uh, doing an MRI prior to them having uh, three sets of PRP injections. The PRP injections are going to be taking the blood, sending it off the pathology, then they're going to then get it back, and then know exactly what they're injecting, and then going to do functional uh, scores on them, and then a repeat MRI a year later. And this, is, I think, is a really, really important study for us to know exactly does this work. Or is it a placebo? So we're very, very interested to see the results of this. 
Pentasan polysulfate, this has been a bit in the news recently. Uh, it was first reported as chondroprotective back in the, in the 80s, similar to heparin, which noted as a blood thinning agent. And the oral form has been used by prescription currently for interstitial cystitis. But it can be used off-label as an injectable form for osteoarthritis with the TGA special access scheme when all other treatment options are exhausted. And it's thought to reduce osteoarthritic pain by reducing the pain from subchondral bone edema. And it's not, not performance enhancing, hence you might hear why it's being used in, in, in uh, athletes. But it's still in the clinical trial phase and, and on the back of a promising pilot trial in 2004. So this is again, watch this space. Um, and uh, we need, but we need a hell of a lot more data before we can use this because it does have side effects, including swelling, headaches, and and, gut, and the upset of the gastrointestinal tract. The speed with the stem cells, mesocarnal stem cells, which our college has has been proactive in this area, looking at the evidence. This is our third, I guess, uh, position statement on this. We did an initial initial uh, position statement in 2015, and this is a revision, which was done by members of our college, including those who actually. Uh, do uh, perform stem cell research um, and it basically says that there's insufficient evidence to support the use of stem cell therapy in the routine management of musculoskeletal injuries or degenerative conditions typically managed by I guess sport and exercise physicians being my specialty. And the inclusion of innovative uh, stem cell therapies into routine clinical practice should only occur after clinical trials establish reproducible evidence of efficacy and safety in musculoskeletal sports medicine. And our college only endorses endorse only stem cell research to contribute level one to level three evidence. But we, we recognise the importance of proactive regulatory oversight for the processing and manipulation of any medical product, including these stem cells. And it's interesting because on the July 1, the TGA uh, are upgrading their regulations with a number of important uh, aspects. And one is a ban on direct consumer advertising of autologous cell and tissue products, including blood injections, PRP, autologous condition serum or orthokine, and stem cells, with large fines to individuals and also to, I guess, corporations. And it will shift where, I guess, the PRP, if it's less than minimally manipulated, will still be available, I guess, in clinics. But autologous condition serum, where it's actually manipulated more, and indeed stem cells, will only be able to, only be able to to be, I guess, used in appropriately accredited hospitals where they're going to be registered as biologicals and will have more stringent reporting and monitoring requirements and it almost be necessary to be in uh, clinical trials, which I think is good because there's a lack of safety and efficacy da data and our college believes it's unethical and unprofessional to market stem cell intervention directly to patients. But that does not preclude, we're not, we're not against it. If it's actually going to work down the track and the clinical trials uh, uh, support that, then our colleagues would certainly certainly endorse that. But it needs to have acceptable levels of efficacy and safety. And the college has, has teamed up with MOVE and, and Stem Cells Australia to produce this patient, I guess it's a patient information suite that people can access both through MOVE and also through our college. And um, just, it's got five things you should know about stem cells and, and where I guess the research is at. But where we are in the trials here, we're probably Getting into sort of phase two, moving into phase three, um, but we need we need more time to work out if this is going to be uh, something that we can use down the future. And, and with people living longer and osteoarthritis, I guess coming on younger, there's a massive gap, and we have to find something that's actually going to help people's knees uh, and osteoarthritis. And, and this might be it. We don't know, but we've got to be very. We've got to make sure that we've got the evidence, and we've got to make sure that it's safe. Uh, most important. So the first one is, the first one I'll go through a few cases for you. And I guess this is the first one. This is a 55-year-old a male real estate agent presents with type 2 diabetes. And I, I don't mean, not a stereotype, but this is just someone I guess who sits down, drives a lot. Um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obstructive sleep apnea. He's got a BMI of 35, so he's, he's obese. And he's got right knee osteoarthritis. And, I, and the, the exercise vital sign for him is 30, which is 30 minutes of exercise a week that he does. So he is inactive. And I guess the management of this is um, how would we manage this? And so the most important thing for him is I guess, yes, you need to sit him down and really tell him that he's a ticking time bomb here. Um, it's important that he has the appropriate weight loss, um, a gentle, gradual exercise program. And he will need to tee in um, with, uh, easily with a, a physiotherapist, 
an exercise physiologist to progress his strength, to progress his, um, his exercise. Um, as far as he's off obstructive sleep apnea, we could probably control a fair bit of his hypertension if we referred him off for a sleep study and maybe looking at a respiratory physician, maybe seeing a dentist so that he can get a splint so he can breathe a bit better rather than wearing a CPAP machine. And this might improve his function. The other thing is seeing a dietitian about how we can reduce um, reduce his weight um, with, the, with the exercise. And I think it's important that we regularly review him to make sure that he's actually not getting injured because if he goes like a bullet a gate early, it's just it's one of those things that he may start to get injuries with, with tendon, injury, tendon injuries, particularly Achilles. He's a, he's a risk factor for Achilles or other tendinopathies, plantar fasciitis. So we've got to be really careful. He's, not, he's probably going to need to see a, a podiatrist, make sure he's got the right footwear. We can, we can advise him on that. So there's multiple people within the multidisciplinary team that can help him. And the GP is essential to this to make sure that they're monitoring this regularly. To make sure that, and particularly with his medications, does he still need them? Is he taking metformin? Is he taking a beta blocker? Is he taking a statin? Those things, do we need, we need to work out how's he going on that medication and can we start to take him off as the effect of the exercise increases and helps him? The other one that's more, I think, important here is just, just with, you know, you, you probably don't want to uh, do heavy isometrics here either. It may actually, particularly with his high blood pressure, uh, and a valve salva may actually cause a stroke. So we've got to be really careful, as I said, regular review with the GP to make sure that everything's starting to normalise. So I think, in any, so I think that's a, it's a very, this is a case that we're seeing more and more of. Um, and this guy's really at the, it's, it's, it, Sliding doors for him here, either he starts to win or he's going to really lose badly and start to deteriorate. So it's important that we try to get him into some really good habits. The last one is a 38-year-old is a female netballer with breast cancer. She's just completed her first round of chemotherapy. She comes in fatigued. She's previously been really active. And she had a left knee ACL reconstruction when she was 23 with a partial lateral meniscectomy. And her current ex size vital sign is a 15. So she's only doing 15 minutes of what she would consider moderate intensity, which for her may just be a simple walk down the hall a, a week. So I guess important management issues here is, is, is prior to starting activity, it's important to get a full history. It's important to get all her other musculoskeletal issues, stress fractures. Has she ever had a nutritional deficiency? Has she ever had a, um, a, a, a menstrual history, particularly if she had delayed um, Monarchy is particularly she had any uh, primary or secondary menorrhea for loss of periods because that will increase the risk of low bone density. And then with the medications, including I guess prednisolone, that can also reduce her, her bone density, which can again increase the risk of stress fractures, particularly when you start to get her back to, to exercise or particularly impact exercise. And it's most important that when you're examining her to make sure that you assess her function, that she doesn't have any pain, particularly I guess on hopping, and to exclude what that. Um, it's important to check with the oncologist first. It's important to probably give them a call to make sure, is this okay? Um, make sure that you've got an update on the recent bloods to make sure there's no evidence of anemia or neutropenia, low platelets, or other issues like neuropathy. So it's important to always be checking in with, with the, the oncologist and I guess uh, making sure that there's an exercise physiologist who's really closely involved with this. And the benefits, I guess, of exercise on cancer, there's more and more research showing that it improves mood, strength, function, appetite, reduces nausea, and can improve the concentration and bioavailability of the chemotherapy, making sure that more of it gets to the tumour to help treat this. And it also, I guess, exercise helps to reduce the risk of recurrence down the track. So the activities that we've probably prescribed, given we don't want to cause too much pain and particularly fatigue, I think it's dependent on the patient. It's dependent on what they like to do or what they have liked to do. Um, and probably going to start them off on lower impact activities like cycling on a stationary bike, some walking and some whole body strengthening exercises, probably starting at body weight or with low resistance and then looking at high repetition weights and perhaps looking at the cross trainer. And I guess the absolute contraindications to them, to them exercising would be if they've got a fever, anemia with postural hypertension so they're so unwell with it when they stand up, and bone pain. That's most important that we, we really... Um, really need to make sure that there's no tumour. So in my history, I'm always sort of asking, what have you had in the past if you've had cancer? Because often people will come in and they're anxious because they get pain. They're anxious that they've got the tumours come back. So it's important that we exclude that. And I think that that sets their mind at ease. It allows them to get on with exercising. It allows them to get on what they really want to do. 
So there's a good article put out by um, Kay Crosley and, and Christian Barton and, and Joe Kemp and Adam Kalvinor about do we have a credible alternative to knee arthroscopy for the degenerative knee? I hope that I've given you an idea of that. Yes, we can. I think there's a lot in here that we can do. We've got to work as a team. Um, it's important we champion these approaches. And I think that this is the original one that we have here as far as who's, who does what and how many people might need it. I'd like to think that we can get it to here. That we can get, we can reduce our requirements for pharmacological agents in injections and we can re reduce our need for, for, for surgery. But this is going to take time, it's going to take a generational, I guess, change in how we manage things. And if, if, with that it might require changing in the fund funding model. I certainly, certainly think that's important because we need to be managing more of this out in the community. But most of all, there's one thing that's missing, I guess, from the, from the, from the Victorian model of care, and that comes at the start of the continuum, which is prevention. It's most important that we have prevention of NEOA. And there's a good, of uh, the BJSM 2018 IOC consensus statement on prevention, diagnosis, and management of pediatric ACL injuries. Because as we know, that will increase the risk of osteoarthritis for these young kids. And there's a lot of good programs. There's footy first, there's the netball knee program, there's the FIFA 11 program, teaching people how to land properly, make sure they do appropriate warm-ups rather than, I guess, throwing mud around at their mates in the morning. So that's important. But the elephant in the room, and I'll say it again, is obesity. And we must have a coordinated plan to manage this. We must have a, a government lead, federal government lead on this about how we can manage this because if we can't stop obesity, it's going to make it really, really difficult for us to manage it. Um, and I think that we, it's all up to our, ourselves to go back to how, what we can do locally, particularly with our children, to make sure they don't get obese in the first place because once you become obese, it's really hard to lose that weight. And um, so I, I, I implore you all that we should really do our best that we, we can at a, at, a, at, a, at a local level. And I guess I'd like to finish on my last slide, or second last slide, which is a community initiative in, in, um, in Holland where they get the nurses in community settings to deliver all the care that patients need. And that, part of that is exercise. Part of that is getting them out and part of it is getting them out and jumping around and doing exercise rather than having them sitting in bed giving them medication and their food. And it was shown to reduce health costs by 40% with a 50% reduction in total hours of care that was required. And this is back in 2012. So this is, this is, we've all got a responsibility of this to our patients to make them feel better. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually reframe what we say to our patients if they get knee osteoarthritis and they've got chronic disease, this is really common, you may never need surgery, get moving and lose weight. Get stronger and stay positive. And I think that's the message that we all need to send. So thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Adam. That's a very positive message to uh, finish up on. We've got a, quite a few questions there, um, and I would urge anyone else who wants to ask a question to uh, type it in now. Uh, we're getting close to five. So if we run out of time to answer all the questions, Adam has kindly offered to answer questions uh, offline, and they'll be provided to you with uh, the follow-up resources and so on. Just sort of uh, scanning through the questions, there's one there, Adam. Um, what about liquid biocell collagen type 2 for pain relief? Can you tell anything? Tell us anything about that? I, I guess this is one of the newer treatments that's come out, and I think like any new treatment, it needs to be held up to high standards of trials like every, everything else that, that goes through. And they've got to be randomised controlled trials, double blind. Uh, against placebo to see if they actually work and I, I don't, I've not seen any research on that. Um, one of the things that's really important that's going on at the moment is there's a national osteoarthritis strategy and there are groups at the moment of physicians, physiotherapists, all sorts of clinicians, osteo, osteo, um, rheumatologists, orthopaedic surgeons, everyone's getting together, GPs and coming together and, and health economists to come together, how do we, what's the evidence behind everything that we use for osteoarthritis? And this is going to be out in November this year and it's going to pull together all of these guidelines because there's heaps of them flying around at the moment. And I think everyone's getting a bit confused about what does and doesn't work. So I think that's going to be coming out in November, at the end of November. So I think we should all look forward to that and that will tell us where a lot of these treatments fit. And if they're not listed, I guess it's up to everyone to, that we've got to do more research about these to actually get them there. So that would be my message. And Adam, um, are you familiar at all with knee denovations and the success of this for those clients who are not knee replacement candidates? So again, this is a, I guess this is where they can uh, pick off 
some of the nerves that are next to the next to the joint, some of the genicular nerves. Um, we do use this for plantar fascia problems, for adductor problems, uh, for back problems. Certainly, it's one of those things. Again, there's no randomised control trials to say that it's better than placebo, but it's one of those things that you could use at the end. Now, that's a high cost intervention. I think that everyone would have to go through. They'd have to exhaust everything else before I'd go there. That's certainly how I manage my patients. I always say to my patients that I'll move to the next part of the, the treatment plan when you have exhausted all that and what you have is now impacting on your ability to function as a happy human being. If you haven't done all those other things first, then you need to go back and make sure you do them before we move there. Otherwise, if you get a bad outcome from the, the intervention that you have, then you go, well, what could I have done better? Well, you could have done all those things. So. And Adam, um, in relation to a suggestion for an elderly person with OA pain other than Panadol, especially for a person who has a history of uh, ischemic heart disease. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think, I think with that it's, it's important, look, we should try with, I think it's important to actually sit down with your doctor and say, you know, my knee's really sore. Why is it really sore? What are your fears? What are you worried about? What's help stopping you from exercising? I think spending a really good amount of time with their, their with a, a doctor or a sport exercise physician or a physiotherapist or an osteopath or whoever else can deliver some education around why it's sore and how much pain is acceptable and how much pain is unacceptable and how we can actually get people moving in a way that's actually more gentle on their body and as they get more movement then their pain will start to drop down. So I think, yeah, Panadol, you can still try it, still try some anti-inflammatories. As I said, a cortisone injection might be something that they need just to get them over the hump, the one-off to help them. Um, also, just a question, uh, at what stage of, uh, of uh, a person's disease would you use pharmacological treatments? For example, would you use um, NSAIDs uh, or injectable pharmacological agents to assist a patient ease into new habits of exercise? Oh, I'd use non steroidal anti-inflammatories first, absolutely. First time, and I'd always, I always say, well, this is what you should do and how you would do it. I would give them anti-inflammatories and I would refer them off to a physiotherapist because I guess as sports exercise physicians, and I've said this a few times, is our drugs are physiotherapists and, and people who prescribe strength exercise and, and, and people who pr provide advice to get going. It's not just a silver bullet, here's the tool that will make you better because it doesn't work. We can see that. So I think that's, uh, that, that's the way that I would manage. You've got to be positive and say you can, you can get through this. And you know people who haven't run for ages, they can get back to running. It's just how you, you give it. I'm a, I'm a fierce advocate of walk-run intervals, getting people get out to do 30 minutes Sorry, 30 seconds on, 60 seconds of walking. Because people, the high that you get from being able to get back to run just for a little bit is you can you, you can't bottle it. It's, it's what we need to be able to help people feel younger or younger or stronger and more active for longer. Um, an interesting question and one we often hear uh, here with uh, Musculoskeletal Australia is the fact that um, uh, clients having a certain perception and, and receiving messages from. Uh, other health professionals, possibly surgeons, being told that they've, you know, they've, they've got bone on bone, uh, that surgery is their only option. How do you sort of combat those uh, preconceived notions that people have before they they enter your your rooms to see you? Well, I think you just, as I said, you got to sit down. And, you know, I spend 40, 45 minutes with my patients. First up, always. You, you look at the scans, and as I said, you don't treat scans. You treat the patient in front of you. I see some shocking scans of people that have actually gone on and climbed Mount Kosciuszko who go rock climbing after they've got a massive disc bulge. It's amazing what people are actually capable of. It's actually